to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again. And today, just like any other day, we have a special guest. Today, we have the honor talking to our guest today. His name is Tafik Wangwala. He's going to tell us everything about the book that he authored, What We Lost, Inside the Attack on Canada's Largest Children's Charity. And we're going to learn everything, not just about him being a respected lawyer and former uh, WE Charity board member. We're going to learn everything, what he's doing with his book. So first and foremost, thank you for your time, sir. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Man, I appreciate you taking time. I know you're super busy up there in Canada, so uh, I thank you for uh, creating some space for us. So kind of paint the picture. What was the uh, core reason of you uh, writing this book project? Because it is a big deal. Because I want to say real quick is that uh, Martin Luther King III, he was part of the audio part of this book. So kind of paint the story for the audience. Sure. So the book, which is, uh, and I thank you again for having me. The book is called what we lost, uh, inside the attack on Canada's largest children's charity. And it's, it's really about the story of a charity. We charity, which is an international development charity. And also one that was focused on something called youth empowerment, which is basically putting curricula in schools focused on service learning teaching young people how to be volunteers, teaching young people how to be agents of change, how to be activists. And we charity had programming in almost 30,000 schools in Canada, the United States and the UK and millions of children and teachers, educators used we charities materials for almost 25 years to try and make the world a better place. And I was on the board um, of We Charity. I'm Canadian by background, but I actually um, live in New York these days and I practice law in New York. I'm a partner in a New York law firm and I was on the U.S. board um, and I was very proud of the charity's work and all that it was doing. But the charity, unfortunately, got caught up in the middle of a political scandal in Canada that if you uh, if you look on the Internet, it's, it's now sadly referred to as the We Charity scandal. Um, but essentially, it was a political scandal that involved um, the charity was asked to administer a government program uh, to help young people in the middle of COVID find opportunities to volunteer and get grant money from the government in exchange for doing it when it was hard to find jobs. And the Trudeau government in Canada, Justin Trudeau's government, when it awarded administration of this grant program to We Charity, right after that happened, all the opposition parties sort of cried out cronyism and suggested in the media and, you know, on, on social media, that the Trudeau government in some way gave this to We Charity because it was too close to the charity. That the, you know, Justin Trudeau had relationships with the charity. He had spoken at their events. His mother was a, a speaker at fundraising events for the charity relating to bullying and mental health. So was his wife. And so the suggestion was that he had done this inappropriately in some cronyistic way. You know, there's no evidence to support that. And, uh, but what basically happened is a firestorm in Canada that um, really caused 125,000 newspaper articles to be written about this scandal. Um, no one, you know, people haven't heard about it that much in the US, but it was um, as big as it gets during COVID um, in, in the front page of the newspapers every day in Canada. And the ultimate result of that was that the charity just became unable to sustain itself and had to close its doors in Canada. And you know, all the politicians in the end came out just fine. There's no evidence that the charity did anything wrong. And yet the charity was just severely damaged. You know, the charity has some responsibility in the sense that there, there are elements of you know mistakes in terms of how they handled some PR and how they responded to some questions. But by and large, you know, it was a political scandal and the charity was collateral damage. And as a board member, I just felt a lot of pain when I saw that the charity had become a real toxic name in Canada. People assumed that they had done all these bad things, which it had never done. Uh, it assumed the worst about its founders when that wasn't justified. And 
you know, the fact that this charity closed down, but the politicians, you know, were all fine, just was really, really a sad thing. So that's why I called the book What We Lost. Uh, it's a play on words, but what I tried to show in the book is I tell the story of all the beneficiaries of the charity. Because through all the coverage of this We Charity scandal, as it was called, no one was talking about all the children or the educators or all the people who had lost everything, including in Africa, in India, in Ecuador, you know, particularly in Kenya, where like hundreds of thousands of people depended on We Charity projects for schools, hospitals, and drinking water. No one was telling their story. And and they're the real people who lost um, everything or a lot because of the collapse of this charity and this political scandal. And so I felt like that story needed to, to come through um, in part because of what I call, uh, in Canada at least, the increasing Americanization of Canadian politics. And really what that means is this polarized world that we all know in the U.S. in which everybody's shouting all the time and, you know, uh, filling the airwaves with like loud language and crazy congressional hearings. That all happened in Canada too. And I, I think the results that uh, innocent things get destroyed and things we value get destroyed with, with nobody really noticing. And so um, that's what this book is all about. It's about telling the story of the We Charity scandal with that lens. And I think that lens is applicable everywhere. And so you, you mentioned Martin Luther King III. Um, you know, he was someone who uh, was involved and supported this charity, as were many other um, prominent people like Martin Sheen, the actor, and others. All of them are in my book. And so I was very honored when Martin Luther King III offered to read the audiobook version, and we, we make that available now. You can buy it, but it's also on Spotify and podcast form because, you know, Martin Luther King said, look, the, you know, this is an injustice. And he spends all his time promoting his father's legacy and what it means to the world. And he was like, this is a horrible injustice and, you know, real, real shame. And I want to lend my name to telling that story. And that's powerful for uh, someone like himself to involve himself to voice the the audio version of the book. And once again, people can go right now to Amazon and, and get a copy of the book, What We Lost Inside the Attack on Canada's Largest Children's Organization. When you see the response, not just with media and articles, but just the response of the book, <laughs> people are responding to it in a very positive way knowing that the book is shedding actual facts of what actually happened. Yeah. I mean, I look, I've been very blessed um, that th there's been a real positive response to the book. Um, it went to number one on the uh, bestsellers list in Canada. Uh, and that was really exciting because it meant, you know, people were engaging with it and learning another side of the story and getting more perspective. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of positive commentary, which is great in Canada. Um, there's still a lot of toxicity, uh, around this issue and a lot more learning to be done. So I hope that more and more people, both in the U S and Canada, pick up the book, listen to the audio if they, if they don't have time to read the book, um, and really take stock, um, of what happened. And so, you know, most of the positive reviews, I've been really, um, blessed by people reading it, finding that it's interesting, finding that it, it tells an important story um, and sends a really strong message about how we should all be thinking about politics in the media uh, right now these days. And since you mentioned uh, politics, how they played a role in the downfall of the charity, can you kind of dwell into that a little bit more? I mean, what, what was the uh, people in Canada's uh, reaction to learning a little bit more how politics play a role in this as well? Yeah, well, well, you know, it's very interesting. I, I think part of the problem here was, you know, we live in a soundbite culture. And, you know, increasingly, there's, there's, you know, not as much investigative journalism that helps you separate fact from fiction. And so what happened in Canada here is you had all these politicians and they just, they would use like little sound bites and invective and lies and just plain old lies, but on, on all sides of the aisle, trying to get to the Trudeau government and to bring down the Trudeau government. And it, what would happen is, you know, these, these politicians would just say things and the media would just report it. They wouldn't unpack and say, is it true or is it false? They would just say, here are the, here are the comments that are being made. Here are the difficult questions that are being posed. And then for some reason they, they found the answers too boring to report on. 
You know, it's like, you know, people sort of say, well, there's a lot of smoke, there's fire. And, and what would happen here is there's just so much coverage the people started in Canada to think, well, there must be something wrong with this charity. They must be something wrong with its founders or the people who work there, because why are they getting all this negative attention? Why is everybody, you know, making a big deal about it? And no one was doing the hard work of unpacking it. And for politicians, they, they needed a scandal. They were in search of a scandal. They were trying to manufacture one and, you know, where there wasn't one. And, and I think that was the great shame for me is to watch politicians sort of create a scandal for their own convenience to make a point where there isn't one. And, you know, maybe that's politics, maybe that's life, but when really valuable institutions get damaged, it, it's, it's really difficult. And, and I think for me, I wanted Canadians to see that because I do think it got lost for many Canadians um, where I think Canadians just saw the politics and said, well, there must be something wrong. Look, this charity is being cast in such a negative light um, and tarnished um, with with this political fight. And then you stop. That was enough. And I think my book is an invitation to say, well, wait, should you stop there? Or should you look more closely at, you know, whether politicians should be held accountable when they don't tell the truth, when they lie, when they present, you know, narratives that are later proven to be false? Should they, should they be forced to do something, take it back, walk it back? That hasn't happened, even in Canada. Um, and I, I really like to see that change. And one of the other cool things about the book is the foreword to the book is written by the former Prime Minister of Canada, Kim Campbell. And that's also something I'm very proud of because she's an elder stateswoman of the country. She's the only female Prime Minister of Canada in history. And she really had a lot of perspective and just said, look, you know, this is, this is really toxic for our politics. It, it really just tells you how, you know, we can't have politics where just you destroy things for the sake of destroying things just to try and get some political agenda that, you know, it may score political points, but it's no way to build a country and it's no way to support communities. Once again, listen on Refocus Radio, talking to our guest today, Tafik Ranguala. You can go to his website. His website is TafikRanguala.com. You can learn more of what he's doing there as well. When you see the platform that you're gaining with this, it's, it's not decreasing. If anything, it's increasing. How heavy is the weight of the responsibility for you to really educate people through and through from <clears throat> the book and what you had to experience in writing the book? Um, that's a great question. Thank you for it. I, um, I feel a lot of responsibility. I think it was a very weighty responsibility writing this book, um, partly because it was really, really important that I got it right. And, you know, I'm a lawyer by trade. So, so my, you know, I'm a, I'm a partner at a law firm and I am a litigator and I specialize in investigations work. And so part of it was I really wanted to be very factual and have a very evidence-based account of what happened. And that was a huge burden on me um, in terms of just always worrying that I'm not missing anything. And so I conducted hundreds of interviews. I reviewed thousands of articles and pages of documents and met with experts of every kind because I really wanted to make sure that I was telling the story in a way that set the record straight and didn't contain any inaccuracies. I had like 40 pages of footnotes. I mean, it just, it, it just had to be incredibly rigorous. And I think that was, you know, a weight because at the same time you're writing a book and the book has to be engaging, you know, it, it can't just be like an encyclopedia of facts. And so how do, how do you tell the story in a way that's compelling and interesting and entertaining at the same time being just really focused on um, making sure you have all the evidence and you're, you're able to back up everything you're saying. And so, that, that certainly was, it was a weighty project and I felt a deep sense of responsibility to a lot of the children and teachers and people, women and children living in, in impoverished countries to, to tell their story, to make sure their voices are heard um, when they hadn't been. And so, you know, all, 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 all weighty things, but very much worth it. And I, um, you know, I hope, in some small way, this book is like a measure of satisfaction for those people. In some ways, things have to fall apart in order for a new opportunity for things to come together. How do you see opportunity maybe in the future to make this a learning model of what to do and not do? Right. 
<clears throat> well, I think I think that's that's one of the really important reasons I wrote this book is because I, I want to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I think that I think if you read the book and you 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 really read it and carefully, you you will start to think, look, this should open people's eyes to uh, the hard questions that need to be asked of politicians and the hard questions that need to be asked of the media. And, you know, that we need to hold people accountable and we need to demand really strong standards from the press and from politicians. And I really hope that people use this in, as a lesson learned, say, look, this is what happens when we don't do that. Um, and next time we're not going to we're not going to tolerate that both in Canada and, and elsewhere around the world. When it comes to leadership, how can uh politicians get more involved in not just hearing from the communities, but to actually put in policy that will better the communities they serve. Right. Well, well, I think politicians, you know, they, they need to, I think they can get more involved by, by really being on the ground and, and having high standards for how they talk about issues and, you know, not, not misleading people. Um, not for political gain. I mean, that's really my focus. I think politicians can help build strong communities by partnering with communities, by being involved. And, and We Charity is very interesting because We Charity is actually a model for how politicians can engage for positive change. We Charity used to enlist politicians of all political stripes to say, look, if you want to come speak on our stage or use our charity as a platform for talking about what's important to young people and how they can be change makers, we welcome you. If you want to come to our overseas, you know, um, projects and participate and grab a shovel and help build a, you know, a well or a school or, you know, figure out, you know, what's going on and see the work firsthand, come. And it doesn't matter what party you you belong to. And we were really proud of the fact that for 20 years, we charity um, had politicians of every stripe, both in the United States and in Canada come join its efforts. And I, I think it was a model for how politicians can engage with community for positive change. And so in some ways, the charity was the way that politicians can do that. It was one way. And I, you know, and, and it's, um, it, it's sad that those very same politicians or, or members of their party um, didn't see that benefit. And instead of using the benefit, um, tarnish the charity. Um, also, one of the really interesting things that came out in the scandal is that many of the, in the book I talk about how many of the politicians that were critical of the charity and scapegoating it uh, as part of this so-called scandal, they actually had participated in the charity's activities too. And they had really been active supporters and been asking the founders of the charity for advice on important topics like mental health uh, or legislation or policy, but they ran away and tried to distance themselves the moment it became like an opportunity to get at their political rivals. You yeah, listen on Refocus Radio. We're talking to our guest today, Tafik Rangwala. You can go to his website, tafikrangwala.com. Talking to young people, talking to the next generation, knowing the, looking through the lens of the legacy of what we charity represented in the mission of the youth empowerment, what will be your message to educate our young people so that they can get involved and participate in leaving a positive legacy? Right. Well, I think the message of We Charity, um, which I very much believe in, um, is that I, the message to young people is that you're, you're never too young to get started and that young people have a lot of agency. They have a lot of power and opportunity to really um, make a difference. And that can be as simple as, um, you know, trying to find some, some organization in your community where you can like fundraise. It can be trying to take care of the homeless. It can be um, doing something about climate change. It can be um, simply picking up garbage in a park, but whatever it is, um, there is opportunities for young people to, showcase that they care about the world and want to make it a better place. And when you do that, I think it really helps build amazing leadership skills, amazing confidence. Um, and I think one of the things that I loved about We Charity was it helped make doing good cool. 
You know, like a lot of times, you know, the people who are volunteering and doing good, they're not necessarily the coolest kids in school going back. And what we charity did was it provided these clubs in schools where you could basically find like-minded people and say, let's work on a project. Let's tackle something and solve it together. And it sort of made giving back and volunteering and being part of community and made it cool in a way that I think really, really um, transformed a lot of young people. And I think that's, that's an important message that I would say to young people today, it, it, whether through we, we charity or other vehicles is to find ways to be an agent of change right from the get go. And it, it'll serve people well throughout their lives. Yeah. I want to pick up on that word serve you as a professional what does service mean to you and how can people better recognize the, the, how I want to say this, the um, byproduct of what happens when you live a life of service? Yeah, well, look, you know, I mean, the life, I, look, I personally believe um, that serving others and serving your community is um really one of the most fulfilling things you can do. And, you know, sometimes uh, there's an old, there's an old prayer that used to go, you know, it's, it's in giving that we receive. And so I think that, you know, one of, one of the questions that young people and everybody should be asking themselves is what's my highest contribution? Well, how can I contribute and serve most? And I think, I think service is, is really important, whether, whether you're a public servant uh, you know, in, in some form of governmental role or whether you're in the private sector and you're just finding ways to help people. So in my work, for example, a huge element of services, I'm a lawyer, we do a lot of pro bono work and I litigate death penalty cases for free. Um, I've fought anti-discrimination cases in federal court on behalf of, um, you know, nonprofits that don't have any money for free. And I think that service has been some of the most rewarding that has been one of the most rewarding parts of my legal career. And so I think, you know, everybody should make service a part of what they do and who they are. And I think it makes us all um, better at what we do and, and living life with more purpose. You gave us a great illustration with uh, that keyword purpose, because the show refocus is, is the concept that every day we have opportunity to refocus on that very thing that give us, you know, goosebumps that makes our heart beat even, you know, harder and gets us out of bed. For you, we all face, you know, our storms in life. What has been that one thing that you held on to to keep you motivated, to keep pressing forward? Um, well, I, I think, you know, I, when I think about writing this book, I think the one thing that keep me motivated was um, really making sure that um, the stories of children and poor people in, in a lot of parts of the world that their stories came out, that they didn't, they didn't just get lost. Um, you know, that people knew who they were and they, they knew what they, what they stood for and what, what they needed and that their voices were heard. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the best things you can do, right. Is, is look for people who maybe are in the shadows a little bit and whose voices aren't heard. And if you have an opportunity, uh, I certainly did with this book to, find ways to make those unheard voices have a platform and be recognized. I think it's a really, you know, that, that's something that gives, um, gives a lot of purpose to life and allows me, uh, certainly uh, it was the reason I was able to write this book and it was the reason I was able to devote, you know, hundreds of hours to and thousands of hours, maybe to, to putting it together, even when it seemed really daunting and challenging. Once again, you can get this book right now. It's available on Amazon, What We Lost Inside the Attack on Canada's Largest Children's Charity. We've been talking to our special guest today, Tafik Rain Guala. You can go to Tafik Rain Guala website. It's tafikrainguala.com. Once again, sir, I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you uh, having me on. 